Welcome back to Rome Boys. On this episode, we're visiting with Father Braun. Such a good name. Braun. That's what my coffee mug says. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you forget. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know where the name comes from? Uh, some it's German. My my dad's okay. side is German. They moved to Chilton, Texas, in the early 1900s. Chilton's a town of about 900 people south of Waco. His dad and mom literally are full blood Germans. My grandparents got rest of them, and so my dad grew up in Chilton, or surrounded by mostly his Baptist family. Like my dad was Baptist, and. Uh, in a Whoa. small, small, like he went to K through eight, went through it to a one bedroom school, um, eventually moved up into the big high school where they had like 60 kids. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this is in the 50s and 60s, but uh, that's where the German side of my family came in, uh, was into Texas in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And then oh, yeah. My mom's side is mutts, been in America for 400 years, German, Irish. The French, all kinds of things. So, yeah, yeah. With the German side, the bronze side is uh, German Baptist from somewhere in Germany that some of my family has visited. I've never visited them. Wow. Maybe I'll get there someday. There you yeah. Go. Bucket list. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Gates. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to America. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're here in Northeast Texas. The extreme tip. Yeah. yeah. Next so, Arcana, yeah. So, and what's like, the percentage of Catholics here? Uh, four wow. percent, maybe. Bring it on. Wow. Five on a good weekend. Wow. Yeah. yeah. yeah 5%. So that, how's that an advantage and a disadvantage? You know, to be in a place where not as many Catholics. Yeah, it. This is where I've grown up in. I'm born and raised in Longview, which is about 80 miles south of here, and so I'm very accustomed to that adversarial mindset of. It's us versus them, but it, but I will say in the almost four years I've been alive, I've seen that soften quite a bit in okay. terms of the us versus them mentality. Thanks be to God. But yes. mm. uh, but it obviously it, it forces you as a Catholic, even at a very young age, for me uh, to really think about what I believe because mm -hmm. literally my peers in fifth and sixth grade are asking me why do y'all you know why do y'all do what you do and mm. why do y'all why are y'all Catholic and not Christian you know mm. stuff yeah. like that. So you're getting these. Kind of accusations and things and hmm. thrown at you that it, again it's innocence it's they her, heard their preacher say something and then they're just repeating what their preacher said and mm -hmm. so you know even then i had a little bit of wisdom i think my mom really imbued that on me because she she grew up in southern california where it was a much more catholic culture and much more dominant so kind of had the mindset of i know what it's like to be on that side of the fence and and be more in the socially dominant position so she just taught me to be patient, to listen, and uh, to to ask. You know, when they ask a question, to answer and ask them back. Yeah. So I think we try to do that with our people as much as yeah. we can too. Is you know not just teach a good defense or an apology for for your faith, but really to invite. And what you guys do, I think, is just so amazing. Is continue to invite people. Uh, Chris, you were talking the time I got to hear mm -hmm. you last night. Like the joy of being Catholic is fundamentally what has continued to enliven me. It's like, I, mm. I can't find that joy in other churches, and I've, mm. I've looked. How can you argue with that? And yeah. I've tried to find it, and you know, it's it's here. So, being the, the kind of, the little guys in the, the big sea of Protestant yeah. churches, mm -hmm. I mean, we've got, got it's a town of 70,000 people if you combine the, the populations on both sides, and I think there's 70, Protestant churches, That's crazy. you know, so wow. uh, and there's two Catholic churches in the, in wow. the two counties. So, yeah, it's just a, it's a different world. And I think yeah. even out in West Texas, you guys go through this, too. There's a lot sure. of uh, startup non-denominationals and then the, the Southern Baptists and, the uh, you know, Church of Christ and Pentecostals. So uh, the in the extremes of our great state and great as it is, we, mm -hmm. we experience that uh, readiness to defend and that readiness to to evangelize because it's been kind of by the culture we live in, it's been placed on us from, you know, from the get-go. We've mm -hmm. got to be able to, to talk about why Christ matters to us and mm -hmm. why the church is 
the way we follow Christ. Mm -hmm. It's so you, it, it's interesting to see the alarm on Protestant brothers and sisters' faces when when I just say I love Jesus. I'm like, <laughs> you know who Jesus is, yeah. and you're Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> You serious? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I didn't think y'all did that. Yeah, right. Yeah. If it's, you're in headlights. Whoa. It's, yeah. <laughs> we so, need to say that more. It's yeah. true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in 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 the in that culture that you've uh, described here, uh, are the, do you participate in any sort of non-denominational uh, pastor gatherings and yeah, such? Yeah. Occasionally, we the, the university actually here uh, last year did a, a six-part panel series: three in the fall, three in the spring. Um, kind of a World Religions panel, it was optional, and you know, there was 30 to 40 students usually at those things, but it was great because I got to meet some of these guys that I really otherwise would probably not know, um, just because, not that we don't want to spend time with each other, but we're, we're all pretty busy yeah. men uh -huh. and women who are ministering here, and that's one of the nice things is our, our people actually want to be ministered to, they're not mm. just checking in on Sundays, there's, mm. there's a daily flow of, of people coming in and out the door, or on your on the phone, or whatever, so... Uh, so that was a good opportunity, and I, I think a couple of us have continued to kind of keep that connection. Um, we meet for you know tacos and beer occasionally, and just you know nice. kind of catching up with each other. And to a degree, I think we help minister to one another, uh, whether we're Catholic or not. We we have the ability to talk about Christ as our the central focus of our lives, and so that's been good. I will say I find a lot of the posturing that comes with that very annoying. Um, yeah. I used to do, in, when I was in my old assignment, I used to do the, uh, I would call it the kind of interreligious uh, dialogue and panels and stuff. And, you know, it was... Surface level? Yeah. It was just so, yeah, it was boring. I was like sitting next to a guy from uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and like, mm. I want to spend an hour talking about why you don't drink coffee. Like that. <laughs> yeah. Like or all this other stuff. Or, yeah. yeah like, like, let's talk about that, yeah, yeah. let alone the alcohol issue. But, you know, uh, <laughs> but, but we always had to kind of just keep, you know, guy smiley and, and we couldn't talk about the substance of what we believe. Mm. And so yeah. I, I didn't like that kind of engagement. So this, where I've experienced here in Texarkana has really been different and uh, I, I think as pastors, particularly as Catholics, in relatively small uh, population centers where we are the extreme minority, the, the more we can do to be out and about with the people, whether it's going to, for me, I you know go grocery shopping in my cassock, I go, mm -hmm. don't, don't go out to eat that often, but when I do, I'm always vested in my cassock because I think that public witness and that opportunity is, you know, something we've got to do as you said we just got to tell people we love jesus and that's 99% yeah. of the time after they're done staring at me and dropping food <laughs> out any of their stories mouth. from that <laughs> oh 100% <laughs> please give right. us one yeah, or two like, right if you could like i mean you're walking to a restaurant you got a cat literally just a looks. few just a few days ago yeah i mean staring at me as if i was a <laughs> Beautiful blonde-haired girl <laughs> walked off the beach. No, I'm just a dude. I'm a 40-year-old man who's wearing a black dress, but uh, yeah. it's kind of the same gawking expression. So, uh, so yeah. What I often do when people do that is I, I will then turn to them and say, "Hi, I'm Father Braun. Yeah. I'm a Catholic priest. I love Jesus Christ." Hmm. Is there a question? Yeah. Would you like me to explain? I would love to hear this. So would I. You have because you, you stared at me since I walked yeah, in the yeah, door. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's kind of unnerving, I'm sure, for them. But I, I try to put it as charitably and, you know, yeah, kind of break that, break that ice a little bit. But, um, yeah, I mean, I've had people who have then said, you, you make no sense to me. Like, mm. ah. like what you are, who you are, what you, you know. So, so I've sat down and ended up, you know, interrupting somebody's lunch for 30 minutes to talk about what it is we believe or what it is that I think that the that Christ teaches and Good that's been handed on to us. But yeah, probably the best ones are the, it's always the airports, you know. <laughs> wow, it's so weird how you run into people at the airport. Don't you think that's weird? Definitely weird. Uh, you get what we call, you know, like a, a little great white whale, the Moby Dick stories. You get the guy who, or the gal who hasn't been to confession in 30 uh, years and oh, they're wow. like, you're, you just happen to be sitting next to him providentially, yes. and um, then they, just, hmm. they pour out their heart for the Praise next two God. hours. And yeah. So that's a great opportunity. That's one of the reasons I do wear the I cassock bet. all the time. <laughs> um, there's occasions when I'm going, when I'm explicitly going on vacation to go skiing or hiking. Yeah. This thing, because this thing makes no sense when yeah. I'm going skiing or hiking. <laughs> yeah. I can stuff in the bag, put on normal clothes, and get a little bit of that anonymity. But even yeah. then, you know, I'm gonna pray my rosary or pray my bereavery. So it's it's not uncommon, of course, uh, especially when I'm wearing this, but even when I'm not, to, 
just be willing to engage people. I think it's yes. a big thing. Don't don't times. be the boogeyman in the closet. Don't scare people. You know, because yeah, people are sure. afraid of what they don't know. But if we mm-hmm. let them know who we are and what what it is we actually do believe and do, mm-hmm. you know, ninety nine percent of the time, as Fulton Sheen really acknowledged years ago, is just people are ignorant of what the church is. Mm-hmm. Yes, right. and they don't hate the church. They hate what they think of the church. Amen. So Amen. Let's help them dispel that ignorance. Mm-hmm. So you've been a priest now for ten years. Yep. You've been in this diocese for. This the whole time? The whole time, yeah. The whole time. But yeah. then in this particular parish for... A little over four years, about four, four years. and a half years, yeah. I spent my first five years uh, as a priest, five and a half, a little over five and a half years uh, with uh, brothers, just what felt like 400 things to do all the time. Um, <laughs> and part of that was... I'm relatively young. I was ordained at 29. Uh, I'm from here. I'm one of the one of the few... At this point, we have a lot more seminarians now, but was I was the first actual seminarian from our diocese, born and raised like in a parish. Uh, I entered seminary straight out of high school uh, in 2001, and um, you know, there's a lot there. Uh, maybe we can jump back to that at some point, but just to kind of jump back to what you were asking about, it's like my assignments. Uh, so being a East Texas kid, uh, having the lay of the land, uh, Bishop Strickland, who the, coincidentally the same year that I was ordained a priest, I was ordained a priest by Bishop Carrada, who was our mm-hmm. last bishop and who accepted me in the seminary. And then six months later, or four months later, Bishop Strickland was uh, you know, announced as our installed. new bishop and installed yeah. in November. So he and I have kind of had a very intertwined time together as priest and bishop. I mean, it's it's really been interesting, but part of that is... So he was assigned, he didn't, he may not even remember this, I know we've talked about it maybe once, but he was assigned as my mentor. Mm. And, Lucky. Uh, wow, what a mentor, man. <laughs> well, here's the thing, and uh, I'll talk about this very honestly, like, I didn't know him, so I didn't, I was yeah. like, great, sure. it's, I've met him like twice, he's the yeah. vicar general, Yeah. he's kind of a, you know, another cog in the another wheel, another cog in the wheel, <laughs> I hate to say it, but I was like, I don't, I've never, I've just never had a meaningful conversation with this man, and uh, so... That's what it was, and the bishop uh, at the time, Bishop Karate, again, he said, just, you know, go meet with Monsignor Strickland and have lunch and get to know each other. So we did that a few times, and, you know, immediately we connected as East Texas boys. Like, yeah. we got that, like, he's an East Texas native. Uh, he's a, a, it was officially a Dallas priest before he became a Tyler priest. Oh, yeah. And, uh, but, you know, we we had this, you know, deep-rooted sense of brotherhood that was obvious and I think helped both of us to feel more comfortable with each other. But you know, in that, uh, I was assigned as parochial vicar of the cathedral uh, right out of the gates in, in 2012. And then six months later, got my second ass- additional assignment. So I was assigned as chaplain to the local Catholic high school. And about six months after that, in 2013, I was named vocations director at the age of 30 and one year of priesthood. I think you're breaking Ooh. records, with, honestly. With two, <laughs> jo- with two other jobs that were very full to like parochial vicar to our cathedral. It's a big parish. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, doing weddings and quinceaneras and baptisms all the time. Uh, yeah, we got this guy thrown to the fire. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He's young. He's got a lot of you know, energy, everything. blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and so that's kind of what came, became my life is just, okay, kind of mounting responsibilities with, you know, diminishing, I hate to say, but diminishing returns in terms of my health and my spiritual health. It was never... Never really too bad, but I was always like, okay, I, 16 hour day was extremely common. Oh, wow. yeah. Seven days a week, uh, oh, you know, man. unless I took my day off, which I did try to do as often as I could. But, you know, in addition to that, I, I eventually got to the point where, okay, okay, it's great. Father Braun connects with young people. And so maybe we'll kind of orient his overall ministries towards that direction. So uh, in 2015, I became, I was strictly speaking, I say strictly, so I, <laughs> I was the vocations director and kind of oversaw young adult and high school youth ministry for a, a period. And then um, at the end of that year, uh, I took on only, thanks be to Jesus, uh, <laughs> vocations and campus ministry in, in Tyler. So so for, for about two years, focus. yeah, like I had that very specific focus of these two jobs and would help with other things kind of ancillarily mm-hmm. as needed, um, but really had that focus of cultivating vocations and forming disciples. and. That's where I came into contact with Focus, uh, Fellowship mm-hmm. of Catholic University students. Yeah. Uh, it's where I had the chance to, you know, kind of see once again the church writ large, working with other vocations directors, and uh, so you know, all those things gave me some insights and some, I would say, some advantages as a young priest that helped me to kind of be prepared for more of pastoral life because you're seeing, you know, just gradations of the church as it radiates out, how it, how different ministries inter- intertwine, and how. 
the formation of, you know, it's abundantly obvious you guys are all parents. Like, if we don't form you, we're done. Yeah, you know, that's it. That's it. That's it. And so I'd always loved parish ministry. And when the bishop came to me in twenty seven, late 2017 and said, hey, Father, there's a, there's a parish up in Texarkana. The priest there, the pastor is a really good guy. I was good friends with him, Father Adams. He said, but his physical health is a little, you know, shaky right now. Can you just go up there and be a steady, stabilizing force and help him kind of continue uh, the pastoral ministry up there. I said, sure, I'd be happy to. I uh, hate to leave vocations, hate to leave campus ministry, but you know, you go where the bishop asks you to go. You tell me to do a sergeant? Yeah. And so I, I moved up here in 2018 and uh, had one job for six months. It was great. <laughs> so like six months later, he was like, can you come back and do some work with the St. Philip Institute oh, yeah. officially? Like I'd been always unofficially doing stuff with them. I'd helped with every really every aspect of it, but now it was like, can you come in and do young young adult and high school youth ministry? You're gonna just kind of help us as we prepare to grow this institution. And so I said, yeah, I'll be happy to. Um, it's two hours away, so let's, <laughs> mm -hmm. let's zoom it as often as we can. Yeah. Zooming wasn't a thing in 2018, so I was driving back and forth a lot. Uh, seeing different the, kind of zoom. Yeah, different kind of zoom. <laughs> uh, luckily I have a good car that gets me back and forth. But, uh, <laughs> But then with the pandemic, of course, you know, it did become much, much more virtually related. And, and so now I'm able to kind of better balance that uh, work-life balance, as they say. Uh, you guys know that is yeah. I'm a full-time pastor here at Sacred Heart and love my people, love my responsibilities here and, and just absolutely enjoy pastoring, a sh uh, shepherding and pastoring a parish, but still contribute a, a fair amount to the, to the diocese, particularly through the St. Philip Institute. Uh, a friend of mine, Scott Hoy, works with yeah. uh, the Tyler Diocese and a uh, great family. But one of the things that we talked about with Bishop Strickland is uh, having the other side of the pastoral side, uh, but the other side being the administrative side. Mm -hmm. uh, do you felt like what some of the things that you just um, walked us through mm -hmm. helped you on that side of it? Yeah, yeah, it did. It, it did. Yeah, just people. Kinda, yeah, practically speaking, um, we're not trained very much in the seminary. It's getting better. I do. I know specifically seminaries are, are interjecting more leadership training and Great. even financial training. And to a degree, the, the, the seminary's expectation was always that the diocese would do that. Yeah. And the diocese, I think, kind of was thinking, uh, oh, the seminary will do that. And so I think for, I know, because I was part of that system and was a vocations director, excuse me, Yeah. <clears throat> that, yeah, I think both mom and dad thought the other was doing it mm -hmm. and, and nobody was doing it. So a lot of us guys were just kind of squeezing through without much of that. But fortunately, before I was in seminary, I did have some some broad professional experiences, both in high school and then, uh, as I said, I went to seminary at a high school, but then I left for a number of years. And in that time, I worked in the professional world. And, and so I was managing people and firing and hiring and yeah. all the things that go with that. So when I landed in a position of you've got to make budgets and you've got to you know be able to evaluate efficacy of employees and things, it's like, okay, so to a degree, this is this is that secular side of my life that, that can be helpful to my priestly side. So I, I'd say I had that added benefit. But, you know, just when you're starting to be in charge of lots of individuals, all of you guys, whether it be your family or your business, you know, you've, you've got a, what is it, the, the great saying is, uncommunicated expectations are premeditated failure, or yeah. premeditated frustrations, failures, yeah. um, disappointments, that's what it is. Uncommunicated expectations are premeditated disappointments. If you don't tell people what you expect, yeah. Yeah. guess what, they're gonna fall apart. Ain't nobody got time for that. And you have no right to be mad at them because they don't know what to what, yeah. what's expected of them. So mm -hmm. I even take that mentality in like being a pastor. If I don't tell my people like, hey, this is where we're trying to go, um, mm -hmm. I can't be upset that they're not there. That's I can't be right. upset that they're not trying. Yes. You know? So just something as simple as that is like just communicate. Like if, I know you guys, again, you're all dads. Like if you don't tell your kid you expect them to clean their room, yeah. don't be mad at them that they don't clean their room. <laughs> yeah. That's... They're children. They're yeah. sorry. They're ignorant generally of the yeah, way the world yeah, works. Right. You're not. Yeah. Uh, so if you tell them, they'll do it. Maybe they won't, but at least you've told them, and now you have a you have recourse to say, "Hey, I told you, or I asked you to do that." That's part of your your life as a child in this house. And when they don't, you have a means of communicating. Okay, here was the expectation. Here's what you failed to do, mm -hmm. and here's how we can address mm -hmm. that. So whether that be my employees directly or my volunteers, not that I want to be chastising them all the time, but but so that they know what they're working towards, yeah. and I have a way of coming there's back and saying, "Yeah, goal. there's a vision, and, and what are we doing about it?" And if you're not doing it, or you don't like it, or you don't the thing you're you're doing, you know, with employees, that's particularly important. If they don't like what they're doing, they're not going to do a good job. And I yeah. 
can't again. I can't typically be mad at really be mad at them for not liking what they're doing. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. when I, I was say, Protestant, Munger Apple used to say all the time that you know the pro biggest problem in this world is lack of communication. Mm -hmm. mm. And so yeah, you're communicating with your children, you're communicating with your flock. Yeah. You know, so you're these are the expectations. Right. Live up to it. I think Jesus yeah. did that a lot too. Sure. If you don't sure. know where you stand, like with your boss, right, or even with your spouse you're always in this constant state of fear of mm -hmm. the unknown of what they might think of you or if you're meeting their expectations. When I was Protestant, I felt the same way because I would ask God for favor and forgiveness, but I just, I didn't know, right? And then coming into the church, there was confession. It was it was all written out. Mm -hmm. The plan is there. It's clear. You sin, yeah. you go to confession, you're good. And yes. So <laughs> and it, repeat. Well, yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> yes, repeat. Hopefully, yeah. repeat. Hopefully not the same sins, but yeah, repeat right? that moment of grace, right? <laughs> yeah. right? right? Like, okay, right. God, I see you filling me up and changing Amen. me and keep coming back. So yeah, I think some of those professional things did help. But yeah, it, the church is... A, a beautiful, beautiful thing, and, and she's perfect. She's the bride of Christ, but in her humanity, there are a lot of human mistakes that get made. And I don't, mm -hmm. not saying I do this perfectly, but right. I think one of the benefits of me being in the world for a while and then just having a lot of different groups to work with in terms of, you know, fundraising. Mm -hmm. That side of this whole priesthood is part of, you know, you're the CEO and the the chief development officer yeah. of the parish, so you've got to manage the finances, but she's also got to make sure the finances are coming in. Like, do I approach it as a as a job? No, I approach that mm -hmm. as I'm a pastor of a parish, and in order to lead the sheep to greener pastures, I need to know where those greener pastures are, and it may mean that we need to buy, we need to have more uh, shepherds helping us to get there. So mm -hmm. sometimes staff, it's mm -hmm. hard to explain to somebody why do we need your donations. Well. If you want your child to receive good sacramental preparation, in addition to what you're doing at home, God mm -hmm. willing, mm -hmm. <laughs> we need catechists or we need a director of religious education who has the qualifications and the experience to help us make sure that happens. So in the church's administration, I think one of the biggest mistakes we make is we, we don't tell our people yeah. that real good people cost real good mm -hmm. money. Yes, yeah. indeed. All you guys, wow. right? I mean, yes. Uh, can you tell our pastor that? <laughs> uh, well, hey, no, I mean, but I feel the pain. Like, let's be honest. I, I have, a, I have a world class church musician here. Like a guy who. That's amazing. Li I mean, he's he literally has won tons of awards, and he works for relatively little because he can. Because mm -hmm. his secular job provides him a pretty good salary. We certainly pay him. Um, yeah. But. What's the most important thing you do in a church? You worship God. Yeah. Mm. And most parishes rely solely on volunteers or maybe one paid person who maybe. plays the maybe who plays mm. the piano kind of well, but it's out of tune because it has been for twenty years. Mm. Huh. If the most important thing you do in a parish is worship God, the, yeah. probably the second highest paid employee behind maybe your DRE or whoever should be your church musician. Say again, please. Mm. Honestly, mm. it's what it's what okay. these churches that are packed. People are there and they appreciate it. The beauty of the and liturgy. They, the yeah. beauty right. of it. Yeah, it may not be the Father gives the best homilies, but my gosh, I'm hearing, you know, yeah. I'm hearing mass sung in a way that I've yes. I've never heard, and it's not a concert. Right. Because it's right. not what it is, it's not a performative act. Yeah, but it's worshiping God. It's worshiping God. And and yeah, so I, I get on this because I think that the worship aspect is so important. But yes. your employees, you know, I work with the institute. Most of our employ the average age of our employees is like thirty four. And they're all parents, except for one. She's mm -hmm. a young single woman, and she's great. She's in her late 20s. Mm -hmm. But in order for us as a church to make working in the church viable, we have to give a competitive and viable salary. Mm -hmm. So when I sit down with people and talk shop, I'm like, yeah, we have a full-time position. We need to, you know, for instance, we need to fundraise for, or specifically we need to budget for. I want to pay a, fam a man or a woman who has a family a viable wage. Yeah. And yeah. That means we can't keep paying people a public school teacher salary. Yeah. Period. And then hopefully they'll stay for 10, 20, 30 right, years. Right, exactly. They'll yeah. plant roots there <laughs> and, 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 or, you know, plant their foundation and stay. But, yeah, this is a big administrative issue in the church. And, and a lot of people, I think a lot of people in the pews like you guys, you're willing to give if you hear your father say, yes. hey, guys, we want to not just keep the lights on in the air conditioner. We also yeah. want to, like, have the best of everything we can do. Mm -hmm. And here's my priorities. So for us as a diocese, 
Bishop Strickland wrote the Teaching Constitution in 2017. Yep. It's what inspired the Institute, St. Philip Institute. It's what inspired me, and I worked with them a lot. It's so good. It is. It's so good. It's it's like an unread document, although I've heard it's being read in seminaries some, so that (laughs) brings me some joy. We've read it, yeah. Yeah. but yeah, the priority for him is we want to have a diocese focused on catechesis and evangelization. Mm-hmm. Maintenance and, most importantly, mission. Mission, exactly. Yeah. So if we're going to be missionary disciples, we've got to have missionaries in our parishes who can help make disciples. Mm-hmm. So, And that means you've, you've got to be able to help attract them, yes, yeah. both financially and spiritually. So mm-hmm. that tension of make sure they have a competitive salary and a good faith community that they can be a part of. I think that's really the really challenging part about being in remote part places in West Texas or mm-hmm. Northeast Texas where it's a very small Catholic population to attract, you know, well-developed people like a focused missionary who wants mm-hmm. to pour their life into a mission um, while they work in a secular job. Mm. I want to make sure my parish is attractive enough that that's something that we consider. It's like, hey, I'll move to Texarkana, Texas and work in the secular world, but that parish is where Christ is at. That's it. So yeah. as priests, we've got to, as pastors, we've we just got to do that. And the liturgy here is amazing. We came, we did mass, spoke at the masses. We want to encourage everybody to come to Sacred Heart in Texarkana because it is it is beautiful. You, the music, yeah, you. the servers, homily, the ad orientum, you know, uh, yeah. receiving kneeling and communion, uh, it's it's special. So, yeah. So thank you. We get a lot of travelers. I will mm-hmm. say, yeah, a yeah. lot of awesome. A lot of snowbirds yeah. come down the, uh, the Texas shores during the winter, and then vice versa, they'll go back up. So we get a lot of people that go back up. I, I know you're. I think you're heading to Michigan tomorrow, mm-hmm. yeah, and yeah. a lot of Michiganders come through. Okay. And, um, during the during the pandemic. We had people driving here from Kansas, driving wow. here from Missouri, driving here even from Ohio. Wow. Because we were one of the only churches, and that's crazy to think, in a 500-mile wow. radius, who they knew they could come to Mass. And the word got out. What? The word got out. Yeah, a guy, I remember a guy specifically drove 750 miles. Wow. Oh, and he was awesome. like, Father, I drove 750 miles to receive Jesus in the Eucharist. Oh. What does that do? Did that blow your mind? That just happened. Oh that's goodness. a pilgrimage. That is. Yes. It truly wow. is. And I asked, I was like, can I put gas in your car and said no it's I, i'm here because of jesus wow. said, well, that's beautiful, man if you need Great anything story. yeah it was Testament. right exactly his love for christ was that 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 high so yeah and i want this to always be you know it's not just this parish i want every parish to be an oasis for because we're all pilgrims right Going, right trying to get to heaven yeah and every parish should be an oasis in the desert that is the world it's just hmm. scandalously bad hmm. uh we should be able to find these these oases of, of christ and his light so yeah parishioner actually means the exiled right yep uh yeah. so uh <clears throat> that's that's unreal i want to back up sure. um uh, you know whenever you you said your dad was baptist yes yeah and your mom was catholic yeah okay Yes, yeah, so my mom comes from a big Catholic family, kind of the Irish-French influence on that side. She grew up in Southern California, um, went to Catholic grade school, K-12, through and uh, my dad grew up Baptist and was in a small German Baptist church in Central Texas for, uh, for his childhood. His dad died pretty early on, um, but he and his mom, my grandmother, uh, really kind of after my dad, my grandfather's passing, kind of had a to a degree of falling out with the church, and part of it's just old. It don't it's no casting aspersions. Just yeah, some of that was just a very small German group of people who, after you know my grandfather passed, is like, how do we care for this widow? And I think my my dad particularly, he was in high school when it all when it all went down. He was just kind of like, well, I don't see this going in a positive direction. So he just kind of stopped practicing. Mm-hmm. Um, and my grandmother, to to her credit, I think she kept trying to go, but. Again, kind of experienced some community differences that just drew her further away. Hmm. But um, so my dad and my mom got married in 1971, and uh, I came along about 11 years later. And I've got two older sisters whom I love dearly, and they're wonderful, wonderful Catholic women and mothers and awesome. wives. But uh, but yeah, Dad was always <clears throat> there. He always went to church with us. He kind of knew all the prayers. He, I would say, and, and I always talk about it, just like. My dad was the best example of a Christian man that I had, great. without mm-hmm. fail. Like, mm-hmm. I knew good guys in my parish, and, and some of them were good mentors to me. And But if I thought about what does it mean to be a Christian man, I thought of my dad because I saw the way he loved us totally unconditionally. Mm-hmm. He worked his 
bought off for us. He was so a awesome. steel worker, and that's not easy work. And yeah. he's a welder, so he's just kind of, it's East Texas. It's hot. Yeah. It's hot about nine months of the year, anyways. Yeah, and then yeah. you're going to go step in a furnace that's another hundred degrees. So, yeah. uh, so my my very good loving father would always show us, you know, both the mercy and tenderness of a father who forgives, but also a father who provides and gives direction. So I was very fortunate that while he wasn't Catholic, he was a man who provided that good example to me. But uh, Earth's mightiest heroes. But yeah, when I entered seminary, it was a bit of a shock to his system. Uh, hey. fair, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, uh, next question. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I was I was a pretty advanced teenager when I was 11. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, I kind of went through my rough and tumble years from about 11 to 13. And, took and, care of it a little early. Yeah, I took care of it a little early. I grew up around a lot of older kids, and that I think it was very much influential on me. But, but you know, as, as bad as it was, it was never like, oh, my gosh, he's just going totally off the rails. What do we do? But, right. yeah, but I got through some of my more, you know, just kind of curiosities early on and so um <laughs> so got pretty involved with christ more intentionally at you know at about the age of 14 and uh it was always involved in church and stuff but uh, but really started to take my faith more seriously started to go to adoration thanks be to my mom yeah saint that helen was yeah. My question there was, yeah what drew you to the priesthood yeah saint you helen adoration i was yeah. imagine that had a lot saint of helen well, my mom's name is Helen, so I have oh. a great love for her. I, St. Helen also in heaven, but my mom's name yeah. is Helen. My mom 100% got me. I mean, my dad's example was helpful when my mom dragging me literally quite literally by the ear <laughs> into the Adoration Chapel was uh, also really helpful. Okay. Um, so that's where the seed was planted, at least I could say. And kind of jump back to your question, my dad just finish that up and come back uh, to the sure. locations. But So my dad... While he did have his initial hesitancy with vocation, um, like I said, I left seminary, and that period in which he got to see me kind of continue to grow, but also felt more confident in my discernment, which is fair, because I think my discernment as a teenager was good, but it wasn't great, and he could see that I was making some decisions on my own and not really consulting God. So that ah. time off, when I you know, when I came back to Texas, I went to UNT and Denton, worked, mm -hmm. and had a you know had a pretty normal college kid life had a girlfriend and all those things um but he he was seeing me truly the the, the good effect of what seminary did for me even in the, the first short stint i was there three semesters was you know it taught me to be much more grounded in prayer and realistic in how i approach the world as a man mm -hmm. um and i think that was really to my great benefit but he also saw me working with I worked with homeless people I worked with teenagers I worked with special olympics like all the things that made me happy mm -hmm. were things in which I was loving and serving other people and you know work was working so I could pay my bills um school yeah. was I'd say school was pretty utilitarian it was like get a degree mm -hmm. um, yeah. and when I was discerning um to return to seminary uh you know you go to your parents and you tell them you're going to marry your girlfriend or whatever they're like they're you're like okay i don't know if they're gonna be happy or sad about that I was, <laughs> it's kind of like that with my dad uh, particularly my mom i knew was going to be supportive no matter what she's a great mom uh but i went back and you know, i was like dad I, I think i'm i think i'm gonna go back to the seminary i think this is really what god wants me to do and he cried and mm -hmm. makes me cry uh, yeah it was just really he was like yeah I think this is what you're supposed to do. Oh, so that's when you know it's right. Yeah, that's like okay. <laughs> right. Well, the bishop may not like it, but it, my dad likes it. So I think this is good, you know. <laughs> no, the bishop was very willing and, and able to. He just said, "Yeah, we've been waiting for you," kind of thing. Yes. And uh, so I went back to seminary. So fast forward, uh, you know, I get ordained, and my dad talks about it this a lot. But he said the fact that so many men that he met along the way, my seminary and brothers especially, um, I thank them for this. It, really, because I think that's a big reason he's Catholic, is he's like, I've never seen men, and he was in the Marines, you know, he's a pretty tough dude. Mm. He's a farmer. Yeah. He's not a man who gets sentimental about much of anything. Mm. Uh, but he's like, I've never seen men so committed mm. to God. Uh. And that was, you know, since chills down my spine. I think you guys got it too. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, we got it. Dad, we're, we're really screw ups actually. But <laughs> yeah. Glad we fooled you, but uh, you know, yeah. But uh, thanks a bunch. Yeah, yeah but lot, he man. just said, I, I've never, and he's, he's getting, he's been around, he's seen things and he said, you guys love God in a way that's just absolutely amazing. And what sacrifices you make, um, what headaches you deal with, you know, cause he, he Again, he grew up going to church. I grew up with him going to church. So he knew our priest. He knew what kind of lives we lived. And uh, so that was kind of the beginning. So when I got ordained, he said, 
congratulations, I love you, son, I'm going to continue to pray for you and everything else. And then really fast forward because I can ramble about it all the time, but five years later, so 2016, um, my dad called me and it was summertime, I think. We had just like gone on vacation maybe even, I don't remember, but he was like, son, I'm, I'm, I'm going to become Catholic. I feel shocked. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the greatest yeah. thing I've ever heard? It's like the second greatest day of my life. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, so Christmas of 2016, I brought my dad in the church. Oh, my oh. goodness. In the parish that I was baptized in, confirmed in, received first communion, and was ordained a deacon in. Wow. So, you know, <sighs> couldn't, couldn't have been a better, a better gift for That's me. That's so. like, wow. that thing wow. beats like Babe Ruth and Hank Aaron always talk about the sacramental grand slam that I got to experience, you know, coming into the same church and doing all yeah. this, but that's a whole uh, other yeah, level. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, pretty awesome. So, Being able to bring in your dad, that was yeah. so yeah. supportive. How many people can say that? From, <laughs> yeah. even, from being a Baptist to, to just, oh. Yeah. Gave me chills. Yeah, yeah, man. And a tear in the eye. Thanks yeah, for that. yeah. <laughs> he's, he's my hero, and I love yeah. him dearly. Wow. So, that, so he's a pretty good Catholic. I mean, he shows up. He, <laughs> I mean, realistically, he he still he still is, even though it's seven years later, almost now. Like, he goes to mass, goes to daily mass occasionally. My mom goes to adoration because my mom, like I said, she's a saint. Um, <laughs> but funniest thing, and I will get back a little. I said vocations are important, but sure, sure. my dad does not understand communion in the hand. Like that's uh, one thing that really, and I don't know where that comes. That's a particular grace that he has received, but it like that was a big part of his conversion. Honestly, it was it was not only the appeal of our my priest friends, but he said, "You guys are just so reverent." Mm -hmm. And so for him, it's always been a mystery. Like why, why do, people do this? Yeah, why do people receive communion? He's, it doesn't make that's God. If that's God, then what are we doing? You know, yeah. what are we doing putting him in our grubby? He's a, a it, manual laborer. Sure, guy had yeah, oil, oil and burn nasty. marks all over his hands. Yeah, like, yeah, yes. yeah. And you, as a farmer, you know, like you're putting you're, many times. you're putting hands in places that yeah. you shouldn't, <laughs> and then receive our Lord, right? So yeah, it's I've like gone to communion many times with grease. And yeah, so it's just like my hands are going. Nope, yeah, ain't do yeah. It. My tongue yeah. may may not be the prettiest thing, but it's better than these things. Well, and it is the alternative measure to receive on the hand, right? It's not the primary means of correct. Receiving and Correct. I and and it's not apparent to the onlooker because yeah. everyone's receiving in the hand. It's like, but but why did you go this route? What mm. what yeah. persuaded the population? Bad catechesis. Bad you know, catechesis. More than yeah. Anything else. But uh, so yeah, that, that's one of the things I just love about my dad. He's like, yeah, I don't get it. I don't know. Ah, why, so are, why are cat? He's like, why do you people receive on the hand? He's like, he's got bad knees, etc. So kneeling doesn't always happen. It does usually, but like, yeah. he's just like. It's God. It's God. Mm -hmm. It's God. And so, I've had that, that benefit of just a really faithful family in the background. But kind of jump back to vocations real quick, and sure. I don't ramble on about that forever. But <laughs> mom really planted the seed. Like I said, she took me to adoration, and it wasn't that she was trying to get me to be a priest. She just wanted me to stop being a screw up. <laughs> good, good one. <laughs> Swing real. the pendulum, please. Legitimately, it was just like, just you need to sit down, shut up, and be in front of God. And I didn't know what it meant to go to adoration. We had this new priest there. God bless him, Father Denzel. He was an associate. He's a good priest friend of mine. I preached his 25th anniversary a few years ago. It was so such wow. kind of you know small world, everything coming back full circle. He he had a great influence. My pastor and him were just you know I was 16, 15, 16, and these guys were you know heroic men. I, I saw what they did and how they lived, and I was like, that's that's at least a life worth considering. But you know, started to go to adoration. Um, was really involved with my youth group. Was part of that whole growing up in the evangelical culture around us was like I had to defend my faith and so mm -hmm. even at that point 14 15 I was being asked to kind of like defend my faith more publicly like at their youth group gatherings they would mm -hmm. say hey Justin you're kind of the token Catholic because there was 300 300 <laughs> kids in my high school class of which eight of us were Catholic wow. uh, and three of us practiced okay. so, yeah right uh, that, I guess so it was like pretty small pool uh, of talent to draw from and I, I drew the drew the short straw so but that really forced me to really start like okay I got to legitimately exercise yeah intelligence and prudence and how I talk about these things and, and what these things really mean so so that thirst for knowledge really was planted too at that same time of knowing God in a personal and intimate manner through adoration mm. there's also this knowledge of who the truth is and what the truth is that kind of started to better for me as a, as a human being. Now, I'm gonna say it was all roses from there, so sure. me being a stupid teenage boy, but <laughs> uh, but I was really involved, um, and that, that, you know, that helped, fundamentally it helped. And uh, talk about another quick story about my dad and then uh, continue about vocations, but I remember being 17, and 
I had, I had a very serious girlfriend. We'd been just a Catholic girl, like one of the few, been dating for a long time, yada, yada, yada. And uh, it was Christmas time, and my dad worked, as I said, a welder at a steel mill that was about 45 minutes from our house. So it was like an hour and a half, you know, commute every day for him. And we did this thing, like uh, at Christmas as a parish, we did adopt a family is what it was called, where you buy, you know, gifts for a fam an under, uh, mm -hmm. underprivileged family. And so we had to get all these things together. And um, my dad had to work at 12 that day, got off at like, you know, it's winter time. It's, it's dark at 5.30, 6 o'clock, gets off, gets off at 6, comes, comes to the, meets us at the church with the truck at 6.45. And mm -hmm. so my mom and my, myself, because my sisters are in college at this point, but uh, and off having kids and all that stuff. But uh, so my dad is like worn thin, tired, mm -hmm. and it's obvious, it's on his face. And he gets there and he's like, what are you standing around for? I was like, well, waiting on you, Dad. What are we waiting for? Uh, he's like, well, get to work. So we throw all the gifts in the truck and everything. And just kind of that relentless selflessness of, yeah, he just worked his butt off. Yeah. He's got to do it again tomorrow. And he might have to work 16 hours tomorrow. But he's like, mm. the most important thing I need to do right now is go give these kids these gifts, to wow. give them these bikes and things like that. So that, you know, something like that that just settled in my mind, like, okay, this is what truly sacrificial love looks like, yeah. and, and I can't shake that. And I knew that's not what I had with my girlfriend. I was like, we like each other, we enjoy each other's time together, but I like, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to sacrifice much to stay in this relationship. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's good at self evaluation right. at that yeah. age. I'm like, yeah. I know I'm a selfish jerk, and uh, I, need to, I, I need to learn how to love and, more realistically. Uh, oh, so maybe you deserve better. That yeah, sort of thing. Maybe, oh, yeah. maybe she. Oh, she absolutely deserves See, better. Yes. No. I mean, I knew that probably from the day we started dating, but you, know, you fool yourself for a while. So, uh, so yeah, uh, that I mean, just something like that—a little anecdotal, and, and and it's such a big impact on me. It's like, and I think about that often. I'm like, at what moment can I look back and say that my mom and my dad didn't just lay down their life for me? And I can't. I can't really think of a moment in which they were selfish um, mm. and self-serving. Wow. So, uh, so I kind of th that continued to force me to think about this question about what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And so. Break up with a girlfriend in spring of my senior or junior year. Um, and amicable, relatively straightforward. Like she knew I was getting more into this question and everything. So I, I entered my senior year of high school, not really sure what I was going to do, but at least thinking, okay, God, I, I'm going to do something that's what you want me to do. But here's the thing: I never asked it. <laughs> I just kept kind of saying, I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to do what you want me to do. Not saying, what do you want me to do? I'm but, going uh, to. <laughs> but I'm going to do what you want me to do. So, uh, so you know, it wasn't the best of discernments, but it was a discernment nonetheless that I at least think I need to go ask this question more intentionally and seriously. So sure. my pastor at the time was the vocations director. I didn't even know that. Yeah. I didn't know that position existed in the church. I didn't know what that meant. Uh, so I just went to him and was like, hey, uh, I think I'm supposed to be a priest. I'm not mm. really sure. And he was like, well... We'll talk. Oh, yeah. It's all coming together. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'd been going to daily mass, and, and we'd been praying morning prayer at the church, and you know, I had a real prayer life and practical and real relationship with our Lord and, and, and everything. But, but you know, I was still just kind of a fumbling 18-year-old kid that didn't know what exactly I was supposed to do with my life. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think God, Father, was willing to take that chance with me and, and walk with me and, and walk me through the process. And then, so I entered in the fall of 01, and uh, what a time to be a seminarian, mm -hmm. really. Um, three weeks in, I went to seminary in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Three weeks in, 9-11 happens. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We're literally going to the funeral of a seminarian who had died of MS. 31 year old guy. I'd never met him, but you know, we're going to his funeral that morning wow. in a bus, and the city of Philly is completely shut down. You know, wow. DC is 93 miles away, New York's about 110 miles away. Like, we're all praying, literally praying our rosary as the towers, we're listening on the radio as the towers are falling That's down. That's crazy. I entered uh -huh. seminary the same exact time. Oh, wow. I was in Denver and watching doing it on the, TV. Yeah, doing, yeah, and yeah. it's just unreal what a day that was mm -hmm. uh, for me in my life. Obviously, I'm about yeah. 40, so I, I, I've lived through some other big moments in American history, but that was like the, the big like JFK moment for my yeah, generation. One, like, sure. Our generation will never we'll forget. We'll never forget. Yeah. And, uh, so that's happening, and, and we get through that, and it's, it's a lot of uncertainty. It's like, oh, are they going to make us all priests real quick? Just you know, like, <laughs> pray God, no. Yeah. Please, yeah. I'm not ready, I'm not ready. Uh, but, you know, in <laughs> seminary, and, and so I, I kind of learned practically the benefit of going to Philadelphia, and one of the bishops sent me there is, 
that's a very Catholic city. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, okay. it's undisputable. Like, it. Don't get me wrong. It's a cultural Catholicism, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it's the kind of place where you identify by what parish you go to, not where you live in the city. You're like, I go to St. John's. I go to St. Rita's. I go to the. Like, that's how kids identify wow. themselves. Mm-hmm. Like, even the cool. non-Catholics, like, oh, we live by Cardinal O'Hara or whatever. You know, like you, your ge- geographical location was based on church points. Wow, that's right? fantastic. So it was great. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and I'd never seen like. I never seen high liturgy. I'd never seen a church other than my own, really. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a couple times on vacation <clears throat> out in California, but those places kind of look like warehouses. Yeah, right? mm-hmm. these are like churches. Like yeah, Irish immigrants, mm-hmm. Italian immigrants, French immigrants, brick Pol- by yeah, brick. just gorgeous mid, you know, medieval cathedral-looking things. And so that, that so this whole ethical, cultural reality of like this is how people relate to the church unlike what I've experienced my whole life, was really beneficial because it's like, okay, you can be Catholic and not be weird. No way! <gasps> That's great! Mm. Yeah. You can be Catholic and, and you can be a bad Catholic, but you're, but you're still, like, you're seeing people definitively identify in this, this world view. Um, mm. So all that was very helpful. Now, the downside was that was also this, kind of the same time that Scandals are starting to break. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the Boston report didn't come out until '02, but there's already a ton of whispers, um, and, and I'm seeing it firsthand. Like Philly, yeah. Philly had issues. Yeah, Philly, I mean, I dealt with some priests that you know I was come to find out later. You know, it's like, oh gosh, these guys were you know doing things they definitely shouldn't have been doing. But but I had the, the saving grace too of having some really good priest influences at that point, and, and particularly of Monsignor, God rest him, Monsignor Charles Devlin, because um, I was on my own. I was the only seminary from. Tyler that was there. I was basically the only guy from the South that was there. It was, wow. you know, it's, it's a regional seminary for, yeah. for all intents and purposes. So I stick out like a sore thumb. Mm. Um, I'd say y'all. Um, <laughs> I wear boots. Yeah. Um, I don't care about you know your feelings as a Northeastern. <laughs> yeah. you know, more practical, like what are we doing? You know? Yeah. So, so there's a lot of cultural shock for me, but you know, this good Monsignor, he was very reasoned and wis- wise. And he just kind of took me under his, under his wings to, to give me some insights that were really helpful, again, as a priest, because as a young man studying to be a priest, because he had lived through the tumultuous 60s, 70s. He was ordained a priest in 55. Like, this guy had some, had some tread on the tires, right? Yeah. And uh, so it was the early 2000s, since so most of his priesthood had been spent in the latter half of the last century. And, you know, so he just, he would give me these stories, kind of had some great pictures, just things that he's like, you know, Justin, this is what priesthood is, hmm. and and that at least gave me more a sense of my own understanding of what priestly life would be like, you know. But of course, you know, I left. <laughs> All <laughs> right. that to say, I yeah. left, and yeah. uh, and leaving seminary was uh, again the best thing for me. My dad could see that from when I was eighteen and entered that there was some maturing and some things in life that I probably needed to experience, and and I, I think some healing that had to happen too. Um, but more than anything, I, I was still telling God kind of what I'm going to do mm. and not asking God what, mm-hmm. what I need to do, what he wants me to do. So when I left, I, I you know, went to college and worked and worked two full-time jobs for a while, had a girlfriend, volunteered, all these things. But that's when I really started to say, okay, God, what do you, what do you want from me? Mm. What do you want from me? Instead of saying, I'll do what you want me to do, but not really listening. Mm. What do you want from me? I surrender to your will! <laughs> and uh, in that time, really, it just became abundantly clear that it was the priesthood mm-hmm. thank you yeah you're yes, yes. Uh, you know it, it's interesting how you go out and experience your philadelphia and the seminary and even the secular career path it just seems to give you a global perspective mm-hmm. on the church and the world and people mm-hmm. and i think that's very advantageous for you mm-hmm. yeah and for us all mm-hmm. yeah i wish more seminarians like as vocation director i was pretty emphatic about this like do a mission trip, do a Spanish, do an immersion, something like, you know, this is very much on more on the kind of worldly side of things, but like, leave America for a week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Realize the benefits we have, the many, many blessings. Realize we're not as bad as we or we're told we are. Right. Um, and that's one of the biggest things. I, I don't yeah. like the idea. People say that we're this racially divided kind of like, yeah. spend a week in almost any other country in the world and you will see real racism. You will hear it. You will see it. Um, mm. We're a very, very tolerant and generous 
country as a whole to people. Mm. Yes, individuals can be racist, but I mean, my gosh, it's, uh, it's just so radically different when you get outside our little bubble. Um, mm. So those little things help, um, but also just work experiences, uh, a big thing. So even if a seminarian comes in straight out of high school and maybe doesn't have a huge amount of work experience, like making sure when he's home or when he's back in the diocese in the summer, that he's doing things that are physically demanding, um, that he's learning to work in a team, that he's learning that he's not always going to be the only voice in the room and not everything goes his way. Mm. Um, you know, as a seminarian, that's going to be more often experienced. Whereas as a pastor, yeah, I mean, it's very much the case people tend to be, your, your, your way is the best way, Father, and that's not healthy because we need people who are going to tell us, no, Father, that's a terrible idea. Yeah. Uh, and so you try to cultivate that with the seminarians to realize that, when somebody criticizes you, it's not that they're attacking you, it's that they're trying to help you. Mm. Um, and you're going to learn that in a team dynamic much better than you're going to learn that in you're automatically the CEO, CFO, and everything else of your parish. So I think it's very important we get guys who either come with that real-world experience or make sure we continue to provide opportunities for that real-world experience so that, yeah, they have a more global vision of not only the church but of humanity um, mm. because that's what we're in the business. As JP2 said, it. We're, we are... We're uh, when you say we are masters of, I think masters of humanity. Like priests have this insight to human nature that's just unre unreal, and it's true. We hear confessions. Oh, that's so yeah, that's yeah. it. Like you learn a lot in there. At the end of the day, I'm not a psychologist. I'm just a priest. But boy, I could tell you some things. Tell me the whole thing again. I wasn't listening. <gasps> yeah. Um, but they all lead back to the, the reality that we're made in the image and likeness of God. Mm. And if we realize that, if we live out mm. of that, if we actually just think about that. Mm -hmm. You know, Irenaeus says the joy of God is man fully alive. Like, what mm. does that mean? Yeah. Then you see there's this great potential in each and every person. And, and I think you know, I listened to one of you guys the other day was just saying, like, we 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 can't overlook the fact that everybody's aching for God. Mm. Yeah. Everybody's aching for mm -hmm. God. And what a privilege it is to be a priest because you get to mm. be the one that leads. The, overwhelmingly, that's what you're doing. You're mm. leading them to God and leading God to them. So. Some hobbies that you have? And I play the drums. Okay. I spent That's a sweet. week of vacation about two weeks ago playing the drums. I have a couple buddies from seminary. We get together every couple of years. We don't record uh, uh, covers. We actually write and record our own music. And wow. I think it's available on Bandcamp. The, and I'm this shameless, but it's called the Ruckmores. But okay. it's just fun. We play rock and roll. There is no, like, there are Christian elements to our lyrics occasionally. Um, there's biblical elements, but... You know, it's rock and roll. It's yeah, mostly it's about awesome. the music. It's less about the, the lyrics, but we, we have a good time. We have a really good time. Good. So I do that. I play golf poorly, but I enjoy it. It's one of those things that, again, uh -huh. relating back to my dad in my early 20s, uh, just finding a way to spend time with my dad was mm -hmm. very important. And what better way than to, you know, sit on a golf cart for a few hours and yes. make fun of each other. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, and it's also just become something I do with my brother Priest and do with the lay faithful who play. Um, That's great. So, yeah, I play golf. I'm a big, big reader. He walked in, he saw the bookshelves. I mm -hmm. just uh, try to consume a lot of information, you know, mm -hmm. to the best of my ability to retain it. Doesn't always mm -hmm. happen. <laughs> uh, with things like this now, podcast, I, I, I find my, and I drive a fair amount, so I listen. But, yeah, I, I like hiking. I've done six of the 14,000-foot mountains in Colorado. I, I have you. a goal of, I would love to get all, all 58 of them if I could before I'm 60. And so I've got about yeah. 20 years to go. Um, <laughs> I want to work on that. And uh, I mentioned them briefly, but I'll come back to it. Like, one of my biggest hobbies is my family. Mm -hmm. And it's the hobby. But, you know, I have two sisters who I love dearly. They, they all live within a relatively reasonable amount of, of travel time. One's three hours away. The other one's about an hour and a half away. So... I've got nine nephews and nieces. Uh, oh, cool. I've got two grandnephews and one grand grandniece coming. Like, it's just oh, that's so, know, good. so abundant family life has been huge for you me. You can and tell you love kids. I, yeah, yeah. You saw yesterday, I'd just yeah. eat them up. They crack <laughs> me up. They give me joy. I agree. Um, and they, yeah, and I love that they know that I'm here for them. Yeah. You because know, they need to know their father is, is real. Mm -hmm. you know? so. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, so those are some of the hobbies. So you've been here for four and a half years. Yeah. Five years, working on five. Is there anything that your parishioners don't know about you? <laughs> be hard pressed to say because they the, they know I, I'm also you'll heard me those of you who heard me preach I'm I'm pretty honest like, <laughs> I don't really hold back. I appreciate uh, you yeah, too, like uh, the the candor is very real. <laughs> uh, so no, I think I think they know me pretty well. I, I I don't know if there's anything that they would be surprised by. 
Uh, I'm an avid. They also know this, but I am an avid Shark Week fan. So, <laughs> oh, it's great. <laughs> Being here is tough, man, because Shark Week is the same week as Summer Celebration, pretty much every summer. Oh, man. Uh, so, yeah, I've got to wait until. Usually, it's just I, I wait until because they show those shark shows all the time. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah I just yeah. kind of find it a week later, two weeks later. But no, I, I think my my people know me pretty well, and for whoever else is listening, like you're you're very. Uh, people always ask, how do you how do you better get to know your priests. We're human. We need to eat. I thought you were um, trying to lose weight. <laughs> Lay off me, I'm starving. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it. Like I, yeah. you know, I don't I don't like people bringing us food. I'd rather come to your home oh, and God. sit with you in your in your mess, whatever yeah. that is. It may be perfectly spotlessly clean. Or it may be that you have five, six kids, and it's a disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, like my sister's house has been for twenty years, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. but that's okay because guess what? You're human, and yeah. this and is you're where, okay with that, right? And this <laughs> is where the church is being formed mm. in your home, yeah. and the spiritual father to to the the priest and father of the home. I need to be there for you to support you, but also, what better way to get to know a family in a, in a more authentic manner is yeah. to, to be there and and to let their kids, you know ask you a hundred questions or to sit on the back porch and stare, you know, stare out into the sunset, oh, whatever. The but, best. So yeah, yeah, please invite your priest to your home. We are humans. You may have an old priest who doesn't get around very easily. Maybe say, Father, can we come and bring some food to you? Or you've got a foreign priest who doesn't have the grasp of the language. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. We want it. We want to be with you. That's some of my best memories with priests is at the, sit, house, yeah, at yeah. the house, sitting on the back porch at the in-laws and uh, or celebrating he, mass at the house. Or yeah. Yeah. Yes, mm. yeah. It's and it doesn't have to be adults either. No, it can I mean, be kids. Teenagers like can come yeah. over. My dad tells stories about uh, when he was in high school. Maybe I shouldn't tell this story. Or <laughs> <laughs> there was a priest uh, in their in their parish that was actually, I think, the principal of the school at the okay. time because yeah. the school was still Catholic. Yeah. They're in Rowena, and they would grab a six pack of beer and they would go hang out with the priest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they, would, of course, at that time the drinking age was different. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, <laughs> so yeah, they would just go hang out with him, and they they'd, they'd have the best conversation. They're yeah, just hanging out. Yeah, because you know, you're so. you're gonna just disarm everybody more the more you're in their home. Like yeah. oh, come yeah. even coming to my office, like I think most people know it's a very open. It's literally quite quite literally an open door. But yeah. but I understand it's there's still this officiousness about it that like there's this dynamic can't hang that out with him. right He's right. Priest. And yeah. so so inviting people to invite me into their their homes is something I try to consistently do but sure. to help your to and to help particularly with vocations like your sons need to see that these men are normal men and have mm. normal lives and struggles and you know we're not we're not going to sit there and bellyache and complain but we're going to tell you you know, if you ask his father, is something going on that's been challenging? Well, yeah, then yeah, here I'll tell you. There's always going to be something. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be something. So, uh, yeah. so I think well, it's what, just yeah, good. What a better way to make a, your priest feel welcome, right? In your diet, in your parish, mm -hmm. right? Than welcoming him into your home. into your church, yeah. into yeah. your domestic, domestic church. church. Yeah. 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 Okay? okay, do it. Mm -hmm. Do it. That's a great. Well, I can say this: <clears throat> I've never teared up on a set before of Rome Boys, so <laughs> I just became a fan of Rome Boys. I don't know if you guys know that, but yeah, well, you got the T-shirt already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just hang out with these guys. Yeah. They let me come along. Um, but Crazy. yeah, for you to be so uh, uh, just passionate about you know how you met God through these moments, I mm. just can't thank you enough for being vulnerable yes. and sharing them with us. Absolutely, not everybody's willing to do that. Stories yeah. about your dad too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tugged right there. Yeah, yeah. you guys are all fathers, man. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. You, you're <laughs> trying to be those heroes you're, for our kids. Is that you are really the guys with the capes. I mean, we're <laughs> we're just trying to be supportive of what you're doing. Thank so. you. For, yeah, yeah, we, we borrow our capes from our wives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of times you do. That's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're uh, superheroes. But it, it just as a father, I'll say that uh, to see that there was such just simple moments that made such an impact give me hope because I feel like I mess up so much mm. that those positive moments, you know, that's what you remember. You know, there were tough times and yeah. things, I'm sure, but uh, that that can make such a, a great impact. Yeah, and guys, don't discount that your your kids are going to generally, they're going to observe and remember the good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're not going to, I can recall on, you know, less than one handful of times my dad and I really got into it. And that's great. That's against an ocean of memories of goodness. Yeah. God. So wow. it's that's not awesome. that he was real special. He was just a good man yeah. who lived and still living, but lived a sacrificial love for mm -hmm. my mom that bled into it, me and my sisters. And so that's I had great. no doubt in my mind, that's the kind of man I want to be. That's what.
because that's what heroes do. Mm. And I'm sure with you being the only son, yeah, <laughs> uh, to go to the priesthood. Yeah, <laughs> there was a tension there, but I told him I was like, Dad, here's the good news. As long as I don't screw up and lose money for a parish and I don't do anything illegal or immoral, <laughs> at some point, a Knights of Columbus Hall will have a toilet that says Father Brown. <laughs> <laughs> and there, our name our name continues on. So, yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Father, for this. this yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah it's fantastic. It's been good. And, uh, thank you for thank having you. us. Yeah. Absolutely. This yeah. week, I mean, we've had a ball. Yeah, hope you've enjoyed Texarkana. Yeah. We're great. Yeah. Thank you. It's a good little. It's a good little town to drop sure in is. before you head into the hinterlands of the north. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thank you again, and we ask you to please pray for us. In our Absolutely. Ministry. And in the meantime, be bold, be real, be Catholic. God, God bless. bless.